1933. Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes President of the United States. America is in the midst of a Great Depression, following a spectacular stock market crash in 1929. The economy is in danger of collapse. Among the hardest hit is the one-third of our population that is our nation's farmers. They have already been suffering economically during the 1920s, while much of the country was benefiting from a financial boom. To make matters worse, a devastating drought forced many farmers to abandon their farms and find work elsewhere. The new president has a new philosophy. He believes the federal government should intervene directly to improve the conditions of its citizens. In a time of despair, FDR inspires Americans with his vision and his words. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Among the New Deal agencies, FDR creates the Resettlement Administration in 1935, changed to the Farm Security Administration, or the FSA, in 1937, to aid poor farmers, sharecroppers, and tenant farmers. A small but influential part of the FSA is the Photography Unit headed by economist Roy Stryker. He chooses some of America's best photographers to travel around the country, documenting the plight of the farmer to generate support for programs of the FSA. FSA photographers take thousands of photographs between 1937 and 1943, which are now in the Library of Congress. Nearly all are black and white, but there is a surprising collection of color photographs discovered only in the 1970s. The FSA Photography Unit is best known for its images of rural life in the South, the Great Plains, and the West. But in thousands of images, FSA photographers create a vivid record of life in the Northeast and Midwest. The photographs demonstrate that the same poverty and despair dominates these areas of the country as in the other regions. The South is home to millions of tenant farmers and sharecroppers. In exchange for cash or rent, they farm the fields of large landowners. Even in good times, life for these workers is harsh with little hope for the future. The South's large African-American population carries the heaviest burden. In 1930, more than 80% of American blacks live in the South. Jim Crow segregation laws and the legacy of slavery forced them to endure poverty, discrimination, and racial violence. The Great Plains and Southwest give us the most enduring image of rural America during the Great Depression one of dust and human migration. We can hear the stories of people who actually lived through them because of sound recordings made by two college professors, Charles Todd and Robert Sonkin. The meal bed would last uh, for a half a day. 
Sometimes it would be a week before we would see the sun. It was just dark. And we had cattle. It killed them. We uh, would cut their lungs open and it looked just like a mud pack. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Families in the Dust Bowl, as it was called, had no choice but to look for work elsewhere. How many of you got in family, Mr. I have four. Four in family. Your wife and yourself and children. Is that right? Wife and two little boys and sir. Couldn't make a living for your family back in Oklahoma? No, sir. So you had to go someplace where there was work? That's right. When I left Oklahoma, I was walking, me and my wife and two babies. We come into Texas and we... We got us an old rattle trap car, automobile. And then we come on into Mexico and pick cotton, Arizona. On into California in January. Most find more hardship at the end of their long journey. The new arrivals, dubbed Okies or Arkies, often struggle to find employment. Wages are low and living conditions abysmal. Many migrants are crowded into shanty towns or squalid ditchback camps, unsanitary housing located along irrigation ditches. This is Troy Cameron, Marvin, California. I'm singing Arthur Clyde. Security Administration battled this pervasive problem by building clean and well-run camps for the migrants to go to at the end of their difficult journeys. Now in the state of California, I guess you all know, the president built homes for people to go, who were homeless and broke and just traveling around. Trying to find work in a place to settle down. The government migrant camps created communities run democratically by the residents. They became islands of stability for migrants enduring grinding poverty and dislocation. Although it is different from the life they have had. After living here now for about 11 months, I call it the poor man's paradise. Whether you have money or no, you will always find a place to eat and sleep. Sound recordings made in California migrant camps allow us to eavesdrop on what life in the camps sounded like. My son is going to read a small piece that I written for our covered wagon news. These fellers in the Bakersfield Relief Office sure show their stuff when they shouted us off to the Shafter camp. Yes, sir, done my hide if they wasn't smart. When you stop to think of the things they do out here to keep us peaceable in mind, it's no wonder we're fat and sassy. If you can get fat on... This is Mary Campbell. This is Betty Camp. We're from the Shafter Government Camp. We're going to sing the Government Camp song. It was written by my sister and I. Over in the Government Camp, that's where we get our government stamps. Over in that little rag house home. Over in Unit 1, there's where the people have their fun. Over in that little rag house home. Over in Unit 2, there's where the people don't wear The First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, listens to the recordings at the White House. This song was composed during the Oregon Cotton Strike. Hot Love is a fight for union recognition. And writes about them in her syndicated column, My Day. For union Yeah. 
By directing the nation's attention to these recordings, the First Lady reinforces the New Deal's overarching concern, the betterment of the plight of the common people. The sights and sounds captured in FSA photographs and recordings made in the migrant camps reveal a rich portrait of Americans battling adversity. What started out as a project to convince Americans to accept Roosevelt's FSA program became a permanent photographic monument to survival and hope. The FSA photographic collection mirrors what FDR is most known for, hope and optimism against all odds. Oh, I know you all know me now, just got here today. My home way down in little old town, it ain't so far away. Now everybody from miles around all know me by name, that's Blackie Brown. Now that I'm in your big fat town, I must do the same. I'm a hot shot bum, my way boys, you'll see me do my stuff. I'm clean cut fell from corners, corner, my must see me strut. I'm pip pap kitty, got a gal called Hannah, little heavy leggy, but call my baby. I'm hot shot bum from our way boys. And you all see me do my stuff. Went down one side, come up to the side, rang the doorbell inside, Mr. Burnside come on outside, said, like, see Mr. Burnside. <laughs> well, scratch, 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 said, Mr. Burnside died, committed suicide, of course, I was horrified. I went across the street on the other side, got lost to fight, and didn't get to see Mr. Burnside. I'm a hot shot bum from my way, boy, and you all see me do my stuff. I'm a hot shot bum from our way, boy, and you all see me do my stuff. A ring dang da dang cow he play on a little tom play on he call little bill tom ring dang da dang cow he saw a hawk a sitting on a limb I went to the house to get winked at me and I winked at him tom ring dang da dang cow he.